Brian. Thank you, Jim. As you guys have heard uh, from Tanya and uh, Tim and Charles, um, Camp McCoy has about a 120 year history going right now. And the forestry on that uh, history has gone back all the way to 1911, 1912. But the forests at, at Camp McCoy have been changing over the years based on the needs of the military. When we see the early accounts of forestry projects or what they want to do with forestry, they're talking about the Dust Bowl. They're talking about, you know, when, when the land was purchased in 1909, it was basically an overgrazed cattle ranch. And so they're talking about first we need to control the dust, we need to control the, the, uh, the overgrowth and the, the cattle overgrowth. And then you get into uh, the 1930s and kind of the birth of the conservation movement. You know, Aldo Leopold, um, Soil Conservation Service, the beginnings of the USDA. And that really drives the forestry of the 1930s and 40s that we'll talk about today. And then in the 1950s, you've got the Army deciding it needs to design itself for where it's going to train. And that's something we're still doing today. So in the 1950s, you get pine planted everywhere because the government's thinking it's going to be fighting in Western Germany. So it wants to have pine forests across all its installations to, to mimic an environment that it'll be fighting in the, in the 1950s Cold War. But today we're going to focus on the 1930s and 40s, and, and that in particular means the New Deal and, and the uh, prisoner of war forestry that took place at Camp McCoy. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, we'll talk about the New Deal pro uh, programs, uh, mainly the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, and recently, thanks to Jared and Hannah here, we figured out that we actually have a resettlement administration uh, camp out there as well. Uh, that's uh, something that didn't, we don't think did a lot of forestry. It's more like a Grapes of Wrath kind of migrant workers camp, but it might have been involved in like the cranberry planting or the uh, hops planting or something like that around here. We'll go through a timeline of the programs and the, their various forestry work at Camp McCoy. And then we'll get into the POW and the POW camp history at Camp McCoy and the POW efforts, uh, the forestry efforts of those POWs. To be frank, we're just starting this research. I mean, most archaeology and history on federal land, as Cindy can tell you, is driven by National Historic Preservation Act and Section 106, which means we essentially dig in front of projects. Um, and it, just recently, we've transitioned to more of a Section 110 mode where we're dealing with inventory and histor history and historical projects that may not be directly in front of a, a new range or a new road or something like that. And that's what's driving this work into CCC and POW era work that we really haven't done before uh, in Fort McCoy. And also, you know, this fairly recent history. I mean, we're talking about uh, 1930s and 40s here that hadn't been really a considered, you know, great history in archaeology until fairly recently. So just as a background, I'm sure most of you are historian, uh, history focused, so you know this, but we'll go over just the, the broad strokes of it. The Great Depression is running from 1929 to 1939. Roosevelt uh, elected in 1932, and he initiates a series of domestic programs called the New Deal to combat the Great Depression. And he, it's a crazy thing. They enacted most of these projects in the first 100, years, 100 days of his administration, more than 69 government programs and agencies were created in less than 100 days. And uh, some of those were make pro work programs, like the ones we're going to talk about, federal work programs. And some of them were environmental programs, like the Work Progress Administration, the CCC. Uh, over the course of its run from the, 19, from the 1930s to 1941, the WPA had 8.5 million people in it. The CCC had nearly 3 million participants. And then the other part of the, the New Deal was things that we take for granted today, like uh, the fact that your bank won't have a run on it because of the FDIC or Social Security. Uh, and most of these ran in 1941, where essentially the war industry, the Lend-Lease and the production for World War II kind of rose us out of the Depression. But this was the stopgap measure. So if we look at the Works Project Administration, the WPA, runs from 1935 to 1943. On average, it employs about 43,000 people a year in Wisconsin. And over the course of its run of eight years, it planted 63 million trees in Wisconsin. In Monroe County, it looks like this ran through, th this was funding local projects. It was run through the county work programs. And it focused on county and state land, used local labor from the Monroe County area, and it really didn't have a camp at Fort McCoy. Uh, but it basically was, was a, a county empl employment program. Um, 
But this is up by Stevens Point, and you'll know a lot of these from the, the, the Forest Service lands or the state park lands have a lot of structures that are built by WPA. Uh, if you're familiar with Fort McCoy, the stone gates are all WPA construction. You'll see some of those on your tour tomorrow, maybe. Um, so basically, a lot of this monumental architecture that you see. We look at the WPA foresting. It doesn't look like they did a lot of work. Um, in Fort McCoy, they were mainly focusing on roads, dams, and bridges, uh, infrastructure work for the Army. And, and that seems to have been the idea uh, during the first several years. They did some lim limited forestry work maybe 500 to 600 acres, and mainly in the last, later part of the program when essentially they kind of ran out of work to do at Fort McCoy as far as infrastructure work. Uh, like I said, the stone gates, the work that was being done for forestry was being done in cooperation with the, the Wisconsin Conservation Department, the predecessors to the WDNR, on county and state lands near the base. And it looks like what they were doing was they would plant and then they would sell the land to the Army with the planted trees on it. And then that basically found, formed the foundation for some of the acreage that Charles is, is foresting today. But if we look at some of their stands, like most of them are little five, seven, ten acre stands, but they're, they're all sold to, to the Army in 41, 42, and they all say WPA and or work county crews on them. So give you some idea of what they were doing forestry-wise. But like I said, again, it seems like the focus was roads, brush clearing, fire control, um, infrastructure work for the Army more than it was uh, forestry. Then if we look at the Civilian Conservation Corps, again we're looking at 1933 to 1942, there's 182 CCC camps across the 43 counties of Wisconsin. And of those 182 camps, 109 were forest camps, meaning their, their primary focus was on forestry or pl tree planting or timber work or work in the, in the forest uh, state forest, state or federal forest lands. In 1935, as an example, that's the year we have the best data for, 75,000 enrollees in Wisconsin. And most of these were run by the Sixth Corps Management and Supply Center focused in Camp McCoy after 1933. Essentially, they divided the state around the Portage area, east-west, and then everything north of that, which was the majority of the forestry camps, ran out of Camp McCoy as kind of their supply and headquarters area. And then the areas south of there were run out of Milwaukee. And then it looks like most CC activities, at least the administrative and the supply parts, moved to Sparta in 36. I think they were at a tobacco building or something that had been, been, been taken over. They were certainly down in that part of the, yeah. part of the city. But it, we're just getting the idea on the timeline because there's an awful lot going on. I mean, these programs are passed in 32. They go into action in 33. And people are already moving back and forth. And there's an awful lot of people moving through. So we haven't got a real solid link on the timelines on some of these programs yet. For instance, we know that the first uh, groups of CC folks that showed up at Camp McCoy were doing forestry, and they did it for six months out there. And we also know that, of course, that they were running a supply camp, but we don't know. Several groups seem to have come in, come out, relocated other bases, come back. We know that Fort McCoy, like you can see over there on the display, is being used as kind of a training area or a rehab area or kind of, you know, physical training before they get sent out to the camps. But there are a lot of these different groups coming in and out at any given time, and we don't really have a good idea on, you know, at one time we might have had three camp, CCC camps on base. At one time we might have had one. The largest part of the, of the CCC moves to Sparta, like I said, but maybe there were other groups that were coming in and coming out. Because Camp McCoy had a, basically an army camp on it, it was used as kind of a, if you've got people to sit, people you need to house and they're in a the federal program, send them to Camp McCoy, they've got tents. So that seems to be what happened with a lot of these programs. Essentially, if you had to have uh, people working for the federal government for these New Deal programs, they would show up Fort McCoy and get sorted out later. So we do have good records for the CCC for only one year at Camp McCoy and that's 1935. I apologize for this graphic, but this is the southern part of the base. Like Charles had said, this is the pre-42 area south of what was now Highway 21 there. And this is basically a map showing all the projects they planned to do in 1935 for the CCC. And it totals up to 21 miles of fire break cutting around the base. Uh, they plan to, they do, plan to do uh, timber stand improvements, so that's planting 6,000 acres. No, that's that's actually uh, uh, brush clearing, I guess under, cutting brush clearing. 
They plan to plant 1,800 acres. Wildlife food and cover, I'm not so sure on what that one is. And then stream, broken, stream uh, erosion improvements at seven miles. So that gives you an idea of what a yearly kind of project plan for the CCC at Camp McCoy was. Um, but again, that, that program ran from 33 to 41. We're still looking for the rest of those records. So we're gonna be out at National Archives trying to track the rest of those down coming up. So if we switch over to the POW camp now, um, Fort McCoy had first an alien internment camp, the folks that came out of uh, Hawaii uh, that were American citizens and, and were basically relocated um, that you, you hear about. Uh, also Italian American citizens, German American citizens, people who were just caught uh, uh, either su suspected by the FBI or they just didn't have the paperwork in hand. And then a prisoner of war camp after that to 46. You're asking about the uniforms, Jared. That's, I'll, I can send you any of those. And tomorrow we'll be touring the POW facilities here. Uh, the top three buildings you see up there are one of the CCC camps. So the CCC buildings, a lot of those CCC buildings got turned into the World War II camp uh, and vice versa. So if you look at the timeline of the POW camp at Fort McCoy, uh, December 41, that's Pearl Harbor. 42, uh, Fort McCoy adds the North Post, the area north of, of Highway 21, which adds 46,000 acres. Uh, in January 42, there's a concentration camp built at Fort McCoy, and they literally call it a concentration camp. At that time, that word did not have the implications it has now. Um, and then in March, the first enemy aliens, uh, although most of them are U.S. citizens, arrive at the detention camp. Um, in March of 42, the POW population of McCoy is one Japanese officer. And we'll talk a little bit about his, uh, his story. He's a unique character. And then in May and December, large numbers of POWs arrive. Anybody who's a military history fan know what's happening in May, and, May through December in 43? That's North Africa, right. That's the first big group of, of uh, Germans that's being taken prisoner uh, by the Western Allies. The POWs start to arrive in greater and greater numbers, and the alien attorneys uh, are moved to other camps. In December of 44, the POW population at Camp McCoy reaches its capacity at 9,000 uh, prisoners of war. And in January of 45, McCoy is the only POW camp holding Japanese prisoners in the United States. December of 45, the, the war ends in May of 45. Uh, December the last Japanese POWs leave McCoy for California. Along the way, they had them act as migrant workers for the uh, citrus crop, and then they got to go back to Japan. The Germans at Fort McCoy are held into 46. Um, there's kind of an op there's a, a, a attempt at pro uh, little propaganda and uh, education on the, the benefits of democracy for the German officers because there was a thought that these folks were probably gonna be the leadership folks when they got back to Germany. And so they actually kept a year after the war before they're allowed to go back. If we look at POW camps across the country, there are several in Wisconsin. McCoy was one of large, what they call large base camps, one of the, one of the ones that had several thousand uh, um, POWs in it. It was probably one of the top five as far as size. And over the course of the war, they had held 365,000 POWs, with McCoy holding 9,000 at its max. One of the other things, and this has an interesting implication for forestry or loggery, is that there were a bunch of POW branch camps in Wisconsin, little tiny camps. This is down by uh, Reedsburg, where you know, we had 50 or 100 POWs. Um, and these programs were run out of Fort Sheridan, Illinois. And they were usually hooked up with a canning factory or an, an agricultural area, um, Door County picking the cherries in Door County. Um, but all those towns had at least a small POW camp with them. Those were usually the privates and the folks that they really didn't think were security risks. There were 38 of those in Wisconsin. And between all of them, they held 13,000 POWs. My question is, did any of them in northern Wisconsin ever get involved in forestry work? And we don't have any evidence that they did or that they didn't, but uh, it would really surprise me that some of the ones that are located up north didn't do some kind of logging work or paper mill work or something like that. Potato farming. Potato farming? Yep. Okay. 
If anyone has any pictures of POWs cutting trees, I'd love to see them. So, because in Michigan, most of the POWs in Michigan are being used for logging and, and timber work. So I, apparently in Wisconsin, it was not the focus was on the the the, uh, the farm products. So we look at uh, Fort McCoy as a POW camp. Um, we've got it grows several times. It starts in a central area. What they basically find is they have to keep constantly dividing the prisoners. Um, the Germans, you had the pro-Nazis and the SS folks versus the anti-Nazis. The Japanese, the Japanese didn't get along at all. The Japanese army would fight the Japanese navy. The Japanese folks that had willingly surrendered would be beat up by the folks who had like been caught without surrendering. So there were, ended up being like four or five separate groups of, of and then you had Koreans who, had, who apparently the U.S. Army did not understand were not volunteers for the Japanese, but were slave labor for the Japanese. So they had to get a separate camp. What started as one POW camp ended up as five or six. Um, and we just recently got the logs uh, for the POW camp that talks about all these fights and small riots and groups picking on each other and, and fighting with each other. But essentially what these are, these are the old stables. Uh, from Camp Robinson that uh, Tanya might have told you about. And the WPA basically tacked sides onto them and made them into cabins. And that's what became the barracks for the W, for the first the CCC, these were at least the first CCC barracks. And then later they became the POW barracks. And each one of those you see there is one of these structures with the wire. And there's not much really left of those now. We've got some footings and things like that. but. Most of those, some of those were, were standing until the 18, uh, 1980s or 1990s, but they, they were demolished then. Uh, looking out at just, you know, we don't have a real good, you know, wide landscape view, but you can see kind of the, the guard towers, what, how friendly it was for the Japanese in the middle of a Wisconsin winter. Um, they thought they were in a different spot, so. Uh, but these guard towers are on, uh, several corners of the base, and this is what we'll be looking at tomorrow at the tour. Some of these were built by the POWs, and some of them have German written into them and some symbols and stuff like that. So that's what we'll be taking a look at tomorrow. And then the life for German prisoners was pretty pretty good. I mean, they were mainly kept, again, the ones at Camp McCoy were kind of considered the high security risk. So they were mainly kept on base. They weren't sent out to the farms and the canning canning factories and things like that. They were usually put to work, kind of make work projects, digging uh, ditches or, or latrines or, or uh, things like that, including uh, logging and tree planting to a, to a minor extent. But they mainly worked on the base. Uh, but they had pretty good, uh, you know, most of the Wisconsin folks in Monroe County were German. You had a lot of folks that spoke German. And so there was a drastic difference between how the German prisoners of war were treated and how the Japanese prisoners of war were treated. Um, I don't know, some of that may have been the Pearl Harbor effect, but there was definitely a, you know, these guys are just our mis misguided cousins kind of thing, and the Japanese were, 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 were treated basically as subhuman. So you look at some of the uh, activities, they had their own musicals. Uh, you know, they, the Germans had signed the Geneva Convention, and so they were treated accordingly. They had rec rooms with pool tables in them. They had their own Olympics in, in 42. Um, and they were even allowed to celebrate Adolf Hitler's birthday. Um, so it was quite a, a pro-German camp. Um, there were never, never any German escapes. There was one person who apparently was, was caught on a train going to Portage and claimed later that he had been escaping, but it looks like he may have just fallen asleep in the train while they were loading the train at Fort McCoy. <laughs> And then tried to put a brave face on it later by claiming that they had, uh, he made a bold move for freedom. But compared to the Japanese, the Germans were like, hey, we're out of the war. We're happy with this. We're getting fed a heck of a lot better than we would back home. You know, I'm not in a Russian POW camp. I'm happy to be here. So the Japanese had it very differently. Um, there's a, uh, a cut, a road cut that was made in, on the North Post. And it was apparently made by chain gang labor by the Japanese. Um, and I won't say what it was called, but it was basically a blank pass. Um, give you some idea, the Japanese had a very, I don't know how much you're familiar with Japanese culture and Japanese World War II, but a very different idea about surrender and how valid that was and whether that was something honorable or not. 
um, there was it was seems there was definitely a, a cultural thing saying much better to die than to surrender. Uh, in the in the war, 371,000 Germans surrendered, 51,000 Italians, only 5,000 Japanese were ever captured alive. To give you some idea, one of the big campaigns, the Burma campaign, the, the British, 17,000 British surrendered to the Japanese, 142 Japanese surrendered to the British. So you can, you can, you can very literally count limited numbers of Japanese, and this includes naval. So you might have had a lot of these folks just floating in the water, getting picked up by fishing nets and not having much choice about it. But at any given time, uh, the Japanese were minorly scat scattered across uh, the United States. There were a few down in Texas, but most of them were at Fort McCoy. Clarinda, Iowa, that you see here, that was done as an overflow of Fort McCoy after we had too many prisoners of war of the Japanese here. And so here's our first Japanese prisoner of war in 42. This is uh, Kazao Sakamaki, and he has probably the worst luck of anybody in World War II. Um, he's participating in the attack on, on Pearl Harbor, and he's driving a midget submarine, which is essentially a human-guided torpedo, into the front gates of the front uh, opening of Pearl Harbor. He decides to go in the front gates at the exact same time a U.S. destroyer is coming out. And somebody spots his, his periscope, it's a little, peri little two-inch periscope, and says, you know, there's, that looks like a submarine. And so they depth charge him and uh, damages the submarine. The submarine gets washed out. He decides to plant a bomb in his own submarine to commit a uh, hairy carrier or, or uh, kill himself. The bomb doesn't work. He decides he, they need to take the submarine out and sink it. So they drive the submarine about a half mile off Pearl Harbor, sink the submarine, and then think they're going to drown. They don't drown. He comes and gets washed back ashore. Two days later, he ends up on the beach in Pearl Harbor, right after everybody's got real upset about Pearl Harbor, and washes up in front of a Navy patrolman uh, who puts him in prisoner. And he doesn't have anything, he can't do anything about it. He's, he's essentially half dead. On the boat coming back from Pearl Harbor, he's the first Japanese prisoner of war. So he's kind of a media celebrity. They, show him off, they, they bring his mini submarine back, they bring it back, they bring it around and, and show it off for fundraising and things like that. He tries to kill himself six times on the way back and fails every single time. So they put him on, on suicide watch and he apparently gives up on the suicide idea because he's hanging out in Fort McCoy with the Japanese Americans from Hawaii and he's pretty much treated as you know one of the, one of the gang um, until the other Japanese soldiers start coming in in 43 and 44. And then uh, he doesn't have as good a time of it. On their way back, when the Japanese were released, there were mass suicides on the way back to Japan. Most of these folks did, did not want to go back to Japan. And there were several that succeeded in killing themselves on the boats going back. He again tried three or four more times going back and again failed three or four more times. So it gives you some idea of, of their perception of captivity. Uh, there were several escapes by the Japanese at Fort McCoy. Um, the, they made it as far as uh, Bangor or West Salem. One gentleman made it as far as Prairie du Chien. He had figured out the Mississippi River was, would go out to the Gulf of Mexico. Unfortunately, he thought he was in Louisiana. <laughs> and so after a couple of days, basically, he gets rounded up by clam fishermen in, in Prairie du Chien and escorted at shotgun point to the nearest sheriff and... That was the longest escape attempt from Fort McCoy, but there were at least a dozen attempts by the Japanese. The problem was what, some of them would get lost in the, the mountains of western Wisconsin and, uh, and not, uh, not be able to find their way out. So they would eventually turn themselves in, or several of them uh, got captured by farmers coming up to you know, knock on the door for food and, and things like that. So, but there were never any real, any real successful escapes. Forestry projects, um, again, we can see that in some, you know, uh, Charles was talking about, you know, they planted that big fire break, got five to ten stands that they did. Most of these were little hand uh, planted five or 30 acre stands. The one you'll tutor tomorrow is probably the biggest at 100 acres. It looks like maybe 150 to 200, 300 acres were planted. But again, these were make work projects, probably when the state nursery had some available trees or when there was some need where they, they weren't doing something on, on the base, but it was certainly not a major focus of the POWs at Camp McCoy. They were mainly doing infrastructure, 
construction, things like that. Again, in Michigan, that seems to have been the opposite. It seems to be a, a lot of forestry work done by the Germans in Michigan. So we look at, you know, what, what were the Germans doing at Fort McCoy? Well, they were planting trees sometimes, but a lot of times they were digging latrines. And so that gives you some idea of that. That's what the POW uniform looks like, Jared, at, uh, at, at Camp McCoy. But that's basically it. Um, CCC, we're still figuring out. POW seems to have had a limited impact on forestry. But again, these are pretty unique for Wisconsin as far as forestry history, you know, prisoner of war. Uh, see, CAC was everywhere, of course, but uh, a lot of those programs were being based out of Camp McCoy, so they're an interesting part of our history. And with that, I'll uh, take questions. Yeah, the uh, northern group that you were talking about, the Germans, uh, the Hugo Sauer Nursery in Rhineland okay. had a camp, and, and then there was one uh, northeast of there out by a potato farm, but they weren't potato farms. They weren't tree planting or anything like that or cutting timber? Okay. Like probably it wasn't a good idea to give prisoners a war axes. That's probably a, yeah. <laughs> a pretty smart idea. <laughs> There were not. Um, most of the folks spent their time writing letters to their congressmen saying, hey, get me out of here, you know, or, or you know, bring me, you know, Brother Franz, bring me the birth certificate. Apparently I needed to be carrying it. Um, a lot of the folks got let go um, over the course of the year or two they were there. Uh, it, a lot of times it was folks who just didn't know they needed to apply, have a citizenship card. And if they had a thick enough accent, the FBI just was pulling people off the street. So eventually most of them got the Japanese story, most of us know, they ended up out uh, west in Utah and things like that. Uh, amazingly, at Camp McCoy, the 100th Nisei Battalion, which is the first Japanese-American group of the Go for Broke Division, which is one of the most highly decorated World War II groups in, Italy, in the Italian campaign, Japanese-American citizens from Hawaii, are training literally across the wire from their own uh, Japanese-American relatives who were in, in the wire at Camp Fort McCoy. And it was such an odd deal that they were only allowing the Japanese soldiers to train with wooden guns for a while. Because even, even the American citizens that were joining the army, they didn't trust. So very, very odd time. But no, apparently there, was, there were no escape attempts from that. Um, limited number, probably 150, 200 at any given time. And, and it seems to have been a lot of in and out. One or two people would come in, three or four would get shipped out, and they were always being sent along to different camps or, or being released as paperwork came in. Excuse me, there's a very good book called Solid Wisconsin. Uh, yep, that would definitely be my recommendation. If you're interested in, in, in the POW experience in, in, at, at, uh, in Wisconsin, Betty Crowley's Solid Wisconsin is the best. Yep. Yeah, there were some restrictions. You couldn't have them within like two or three miles of a war industry, um, things like that because of sabotage. That's why a lot of times they ended up planting peas instead of doing more uh, detailed labor. Well, I hate to kind of put me on the spot. Sure. I was just talking to someone about the, um, the reason it's important to have that archaeological record, even if you're doing historical research right. and all that. And I was wondering if you had an example of something that you've been able to see differently in the archaeological record than what you're seeing in the written record and kind of tying that into why it's important to... You bet. Um, let's go back to that map. So if we look at that POW map, we'll be talking about this tomorrow. On the map, this is all listed as POW complex, okay? When we look at these buildings here, these look very close to CCC buildings. They were different, they're a little bit different than these. And so we had wondered if this was a CCC site. So we started going and doing archeology span there and we got 1930s material, which is 10 years earlier than the, the POW camp. Then we found the footings for these buildings and we found the blueprints for CCC model buildings. You know, this is how you build a CCC cabin. It matches up within a few inches to the footings we found archeologically. So based on that excavation of the building foundations and the artifacts found there, we were able to tell that, no, these are not part of the POW camp, at least not originally. 
their CCC, and then only later were they molded into the POW camp. But based on historic records alone, we wouldn't have found that. We would have only found that with the archaeology. One of your slides showed a Works Progress Administration project. Yep, the, the symbol yeah. there. Yep. And if you're doing research, um, you can also find it. It's also filed under Works Project. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to confuse us. <laughs> Like I said, so these programs were happening so fast and just coming off the assembly line. And it seems to have been more about get people, you know, um, average unemployment rate at this time was like 25 to 30 percent. For, for kids from 17 to 25, yeah, 75 percent. So, I mean, you had literally a lost generation going around on these box cars and, you know, the, the movies and kind of things you see. Um, the big thing was get these kids off the street and get them doing something, you know, and getting them outside and, and into the, the, uh, the you know, fresh air and things like that. And then, you know, they had to send back 75% of what they made to their parents. So not only were you supporting them, but you were supporting their mom and dad and their, their brothers and sisters back home. So it was a real, real critical program. And a lot, you know, like you say, a lot of the WPA stuff that you see today or the CCC stuff, that's still being used now what? Nearly 100 years later, I mean, a lot of the Forestry Service buildings are CCC buildings, so. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting how the U.S. Army treats POWs during World War II. Mm -hmm. very, very haphazardly. Um, but then the whole POW program is used as part of the war effort. Right. You know, they get fed better, they have recreation programs, they're encouraged to write home. Right. Um, and really kind of the peak of that whole thing is that in the latter part of May, 1945, everything stops. The rations are downgraded, the recreation program stops, you know, right after VE Day. Um, when now we have, the, the, obviously, it's, it's very clearly demonstrated in your, in your program there that there was a lot less propaganda value to be able to use the Japanese POWs than there was for the Germans and the Italians. Definitely. Saw that. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, you know and I think, I, I think that people by 45 and 46 were catching on to the Cold War was coming around the corner. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that whatever ended up happening in Germany looked a lot more like us than somebody else, so. Ryan, what have you discovered or uh, exist for lists of, of POWs? I mean, were, were, those, were they kept? Were they saved? Or were they interned? Like yeah, we, we have, they did censuses and they did a, quite a bit of paperwork. We got about, I'd say maybe 50% of that now. We hope to get about 100% of it when we go get out to the archives. But we've got monthly uh, census lists of all the prisoners that are in there. Um, we've got transfer orders when prisoners come in or get sent out where they go. Um, we've got medical records of, you know, a lot of the Japanese that came in were only taken prisoner because they were half dead. Um, and we had several Japanese prisoners die at the hospital. And so we have a medical record saying, oh, this person came in, you know, with 85% third degree burns, you know, and they died two weeks later. Um, and interestingly, the Army actually cremated the, the Japanese who died at Fort McCoy and then sent them back with the POWs. So we actually had POW burials at Fort McCoy. Um, other than a couple of the German ones that got re-excavated and sent down to Fort Sheridan, Everybody else got either went, got sent home to Germany or got sent home to Japan. But yeah, I mean, we've got. We've, I think we're about fifty percent on the on the on the names and, and places. Whether we've got everybody, you know, there, you're talking about nine thousand people at any given time. So, and like I said, it was an awful lot of movement in and out. I, I got to think we've we're, we've missed a few people in the shuffle. But yeah, we've got lists of several hundred at any given time that are that are in there for the various groups. It looks like it was mainly uh, single men, from what we can tell. Um, just getting some of those records now, but it looks like most of the families uh, stopped in California. Uh, Angel Island, in particular, was, was a, a big concentration camp early. And then, like I said, Fort McCoy only played this role for about a year, and then it transitions to the POW camp. I think a lot of the families were later on, um, but it looks like it was mainly Germans, Italians, and Japanese-American folks that were suspected or thought to be 
either was part of Pearl Harbor or, like I said, something else. The, you know, Her Hoover at the FBI really made it his mission in life to prove that there was a reason to keep the FBI going in World War II. And this was his, his, his shtick, was basically, you've got to have us investigating and rounding people up, otherwise you're going to have saboteurs everywhere. You know, and, and they didn't draw much of a line. If You know, you, had, you forgot your Social Security card. Well, there wasn't uh, barely Social Security then, but, you know, if your paperwork was off or you had filed and it just hadn't come back yet, too bad you're on a, a train going to one of these places. So, anything else, Jim? Yeah, um, you just gave this talk about a month ago at the museum, mm -hmm. Oma, and you mentioned that uh, some of the Japanese POWs would get letters from home for their relatives, yeah. their loved ones. Mm -hmm. you, wanna, you wanna talk on that? Just yeah, you know, again going back to that idea of you know, is being a prisoner an ideal situation or not? Um, when a lot of these folks started making plans to head back to Japan, they would get letters from their relatives saying, um, why don't you die? Don't come home. You're a disgrace to us. You know, we don't want to hear from you again. And a lot of these folks, when they made it to Japan, never made contact with their families. They just essentially ghosted themselves and went uh, homeless or changed their names or whatever like that. There was really a thing. And then even some of these folks who later... Uh, this gentleman, for instance, went on to become the head of uh, Honda Motors in Brazil. But for years afterwards, he, he had written articles saying, you know, that he was not, you know, he decided to live and things like that. He would receive uh, to these newspaper articles, he would receive letters saying, you're a disgrace, you should kill yourself. We're talking into the 50s and 60s. So, yeah. What kind of uh, artifact collections does Fort McCoy have from this era? From this area, not a lot. I mean, we've got a few, mainly structural stuff, you know, nails, uh, a few door hinges, things like that. You know, we've always hoped that we would, you know, hit a, you know, somebody burying a metal or something like that. We didn't, up until recently, do a lot of metal detecting at Fort McCoy because of the unexploded ordnance. <laughs> so, you know, the idea of, oh, beep, beep, oh, you know, it's not worth it for a trinket or two, but, but. Uh, so there wasn't like a, Prisoner uniform, no, or no. Extra this, extra that, that was the, kind of there of may have been in the late 40s, you know, but after the war, government surplus just it's true, you have the Korean war. right goes everywhere. Um, in the 90s, when these buildings were still standing, they were basically just you know half rotted structures essentially. The doors were there, some of the lighting fixtures and things like that, but even some of those had been scavenged for use at other places. Yep. Um, how much of that landscape in the 30s was tax delinquent that you might have acquired in that capacity? I, th I, think a lot of, I think a lot of those four stands might have been tax delinquent. They might have gone to county and then come to us through them. Um, I know that a lot of the, the original base, the original 9,000 acres that formed the kind of the first you know, uh, cluster of the base in 1909, that was from... Uh, uh, Colonel McCoy. Well, Colonel McCoy's, I think, brother was a judge. And so when his brother uh, raised somebody defaulting on their county land, his other brother decided to buy that land. And that's how you got 9,000 acres of ranch in, in, in Wisconsin. So I think there might have been a little bit of, of that in the, that formed the original base of the, of the property. Um, yeah, if anybody was defaulted on the north part, that immediately went over. Uh, but the vast majority of that seems to have been eminent domain. Mm -hmm. tax delinquent, resettlement administration. Has anybody, I mean, it's, it's over 100 years where a lot of that land mm -hmm. has been farmed. There's not a lot of good history on, on what happened to those people yep. and also how much of that landscape has changed. Where I work there, I mean, up until recently, you could find the farm sites. Right. And so those are rich sources of archaeological history that has been surpassed. There's got to be stuff out at Fort that I understand you don't want to dig there. <laughs> but, I mean, have you thought about looking at even just who the people were that lived there before Fort acquired it? You know, we, we do do digs on all the old for farmsteads and the homesteads. Some of them go back to the 1850s and 1860s out there. 
Um, the issue, any interesting issue is we're doing archaeological digs on property that we demolished in World War II. So literally these were standing structures that the army knocked down and now we're doing archaeology on our own made ruins. <laughs> but yeah, we do do archaeology on all the historical sites out there as well. So in fact, we're just recently we're going to be publishing our, a new farmstead context that'll probably be the best kind of summary of farm and homestead archaeology in western Wisconsin. How are you going to publish that? Uh, we're printed through the Corps of Engineers, but I, I'm providing copies to folks that are interested, so. Yeah, it'll, come, it'll go through the WAS, so. Um, did any of the POWs opt to, or were they allowed to stay in the U.S., or did they have to all, all return to their home countries? I think they were all sent back, at least initially. We know that some folks came back. We know that several folks, that, especially on these, these uh, kind of regional camps, came back and actually married people that they were working on their farms. There are a handful of anecdotal stories and a few that are, have made newspapers. We know that some of the POWs actually came back and visited McCoy uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so there was some, some return. A lot of folks that, that, that uh, were POWs in America did eventually get U.S. citizenship and, and move over here. Um, I don't know of anybody real locally in Monroe County that, that moved right back next to his POW camp, but. There are several anecdotal stories that I think are in Crowley's book about uh, folks coming back and, and uh, marrying into the farmer's daughter that they knew from the work that they were doing and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Is there any evidence or documentation that any of the Japanese POWs attempted suicide or were successful at it at Fort McCoy? There's no, uh, there's no successful suicides. There is one hanging that was prevented, where a person was trying to hang themselves in the shower. And again, that's documented in the, this. We just recently found this log book um, that has basically the daily log of the POW camp commander, found it in a used bookstore in Pasadena, California, of all places. <laughs> and it was the original only copy uh, that for some reason had made it out there. And we convinced him, thankfully, to send it back and let us scan it. So he wanted $3,000 for it. <laughs> But we reminded him that it was probably a, a, a army property anyway, and he uh, he had been he might have it by by nefarious means. But it goes literally day by day. I mean, there were several. Um, one of the Japanese POWs picked up a mortar round, and was like banging it. You know, it was kind of a thing like that, and blew himself and two of his neighbors up. They didn't die, but they they ended up in the hospital. Um, yeah, interesting things like that. Yeah, several. We have several farm, farm cemeteries that are township cemeteries. We actually have one in the middle of our impact area uh, that's 1870s. Uh, and then we have several farm burials, you know, where people were buried out in the back 40 of their own farms. Um, and probably are, are tracking those. And we also have Native American burials in, in mound groups. So. Did this slide out of a book? This right here? This is actually stolen from another scholar's presentation. This is <laughs> there's a there's a gentleman up in, in uh, uh, I think it's the Carlton County uh, Historical Society up in the Twin Cities, and he grew up in Reedsburg and is fascinated by these regional camps, and he actually presented at the Badger Ammunition uh, Works. So I stole his slides. The Senates have access to them. They're all no-go areas. There's no training on them. Um, you're not allowed to do any you know, shooting at, toward them at all or anything like that. We don't go out of our uh, way to say, you know, grave here. Um, if there's gravestones, we check them out every six months or so to make sure they're taken care of. But, you know, yeah, we have, a, we have an old-timers group that is made up of a lot of the folks that are descendants from these farms that were eminent domain. And they still let go out and, and, and talk the stories and show the gravestones to their next generation and things like that. So, But yeah, I mean, other than, than the, there's, a, there's one farm uh, cemetery that's still owned by the township that's just still there and it's a piece of the township land in the middle of Fort McCoy, but the others are essentially treated as archaeological burial sites. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.